Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is where you are, you're very welcome along. Welcome to Alienated Children First's eighth webinar. My name is Ken Joyce and tonight, in our time anyway, in Dublin, we are delighted to be joined by one of the world's most eminent psychotherapists. I may be corrected on the terminology of the description there in a moment, but nonetheless a serious expert on our hands at the moment. Tonight we're looking at therapeutic care of the alienated child and family, a psychoanalytical approach to understanding and evidence-based structural approach to treatment, which in layman, layman's language, to the best of my understanding anyway, means that where we all kind of have a, 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 a notion about parental alienation at this stage and what it is, there is also a professional description of parental alienation. And we're aware at this stage that some people don't like the terminology uh, parental alienation. They don't like the use of those words. And um, it's better sometimes to use a clinical description of what parental alienation does. And Karen is going to tell us what that is, um, how to uh, use it correctly, and uh, ultimately what the remedy to it is. Um, Alienated Children's first vision is that the rights of every child to a normal family life and their best interests are protected in family separation and that there is zero tolerance for parental alienation abuse of children in family conflict. Call it whatever you will. We're calling it parental alienation for the easier. Now then to Karen, an internationally renowned trainer and writer, as well as a psychotherapist known around the world for work with children who suffer from, and this is the technological, the, sorry, the technical description, the psychological description of induced psychological splitting after divorce or separation, the layman knows it as parental alienation. Uh, you can find all Karen's details at uh, karenwoodall.blog and we will be giving out Karen's contact details later on in the programme. There is a rumour that there might be a discount available to one of Karen's other live lectures as well, again later in the programme, to be confused whether there's one for everyone in the audience remains to be seen, but we'll definitely get to that one. For now, and without further ado, let me just actually read one thing that Karen said recently. She said, it is heartening to see that the Republic of Ireland is taking a proactive approach to understanding the issue of parental, uh, sorry, of alienation of children in divorce and separation. It is equally heartening to see that there are plans to address the harm that it does by ensuring that those with the power to create change understand how it can be prevented as well as treated. And to tell us exactly how to do that. Welcome, Karen Woodall. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really pleased to, to be it's here. Such, it's such a great pleasure. You know, when I first became an alienated parent uh, almost a decade ago, I, of course, Googled everywhere and everything. And the one name that kept coming up time and time again was Karen Woodall. And I watched so many videos and I can't believe I actually had the honor of speaking to you in person. It's a great privilege. And I, what we're most excited about is that whilst we have academics telling us, you know, uh, how the uh, how what it is, we have judges telling us where the system is broken. We have very few people that can tell us, Karen, as alienated parents how it actually works in the mind of the child and what it does psychologically to that child number one, and ultimately, what can we do to address it? How do we build a road for the child to come back to us? That's your language, not mine. Um, and uh, because as parents, you know, oh my God, she, my kid came over today, um, she stole money, she ran away, and now her mother's on the phone saying, I didn't take care of the child, or the father's on the phone saying, the child ran away and it's all your fault and I'm calling the police. So you're, you're in this siege, situation for years and it does it, it it cracks you up and breaks you down it is. would you like to start with a description of what you see parental alienation as in psychological terms Karen sure sure well not to get hung up on a label because um we all use parental alienation as a term um, which is in pop popular use and which um, other people recognize 
The issue in clinical terms, of course, is that um, parental alienation as a term is just mired in controversy. It has been used as a sort of political football between campaign groups for many, many years. Um, and recently, uh, it has really become quite problematic uh, to, to use the term parental alienation um, in any sort of uh, serious situation, simply because of the controversy that it, it attracts. And I would argue that many of the um, uh, controversies are deliberately manufactured. They're manufactured to draw attention away from um, the reality of what's happening, which is that children who are displaying this pattern of behaviour, um, which is, uh, we know it in psychoanalytic terms as induced psychological splitting, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But Can I, can I just, just ask you there though, Karen? Sure. You know, you've hit, hit on a very salient point there. They, they denounce the term parental alienation to try and draw attention away from what's going yes. on. In my Why view, do they yes. want to do that? Why do they want to draw attention away from children being abused? Um, largely because the issue of children in divorce and separation, uh, uh, at least in the Western world, has been um, one which has been fought over by uh, ideological groups for many years. So, so groups representing the rights of women and then responding to that groups representing the rights of men um, have fought over what's really happening to children in divorce and separation. And that's a sort of meta example of what's happening between the parents when they separate. So when parents separate, there's a tendency to go back to your tribe. And of course, these campaign groups are just, they're just big versions of your tribe. And everybody wants to fight to be the person that has the answer, that the person that's right in a situation. And in actual fact, if you're the child that's standing in the center of all of that, if you're a child that's standing in the center of one parent preventing the other from having a relationship with you, you are helpless to effect anything else other than survival. And so as a child in the center of that, it becomes a matter of, of, of survival techniques. It becomes a matter of maladapting behaviors in order to cope in what is an impossible situation um, to actually survive in. And so these children really are developing very normal defense mechanisms in a very, very abnormal um, situation made worse by the campaigns around the parents, which seek to hide the reality of what's happening to children. And let's face it, if we were to face fully and squarely the reality that when families separate, the person who has, or the people who have to deal with all the aspects of it are children, then we would struggle to know really what to do about it. And so for many, many years, I think there's been this idea that as long as children have enough food, as long as they've got shoes and as long as they've got clothes, they're gonna be okay. But psychologically, what we know, and certainly from the research which has been done in many different quarters, not just in the um, area of alienation, we know that the psychological impact of family separation on children is serious, it is something which is long lasting. Um, and for some children in a small area, it seems big to me because it's everything that I, uh, I, I, it's all I do is work in this field. But for a small group of, of children, it becomes a very serious issue which they get trapped into and which can have lifelong um, impact if they're not helped to, to move on from it, which is, really what brought me into this this field and is what really kept me there and you 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 were you were uh, before parental alienation you were involved i know in uh court cases where uh if if i understand correctly you were uh employed to uh, layman's terms again get inside the head of criminals like uh murderers and rapists um how does parental alienation rate on a scale with mega, mega serious crimes like that? 
Well, I work with because colleagues. of the damage, the damage it does to the kids. Sure, I work with colleagues um, both in um, the legal system and in uh, mental health who have worked with um, issues such as rape, murder, um, very serious, life-changing issues. And one of the um, the real realities, one of the things that we have to face with this issue is that for a parent watching a child who is being trapped in this situation, whose life chances are being changed, and that parent can only look on and only observe what is happening, the, the torture, the, the extended uh, complex trauma which is caused by that experience um, is on par with having um, a child murdered, with, with um, dealing with uh, serious issues wow. of abuse um, of children. It is, it is a psychological torment. And many, many parents that I work with um, uh, suffer a complex form of, of, of traumatic stress disorder in which they are um, really uh, caused to feel hyper vigilant um, and hyper attuned to the environment around them, particularly if you have suffered from false allegations, um, if your child has been um, really uh, influenced in, in a, a, a serious pattern of denigration in which they are enabled to make escalating false allegations, this is a trauma like no other and it doesn't end. That's the issue. Even when children have recovered from the split sense of self, and many, many children do, the parent is left with a sense of what if it happens again? What if my child suddenly turns and makes allegations against me again? I've got one family that I've been working with for quite some time and dad has had to put uh, cameras in the whole of the house because the allegations that he faced were so serious that even though the children have been moved to live with him, um, he can't relax because he's terrified that this may happen to him again. And of course, for the children involved, the recovery process is particularly difficult. It can be particularly lengthy. Sometimes children can be helped to integrate very, very quickly. But if the parent who is causing the problem cannot change, and many can't, then what we get is a, a sort of um, lifelong need to pay attention to the dynamics that the child is having to deal with. So and that's, that's, that's a symptom for the parent, right? Uh, for parent and child. So even when the child has recovered, there's a risk that they, the, the child can slip back into using splitting as a defense. And when you use splitting so as a just, defense- just, 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 can you give us a layman's description of what splitting is, yes. Karen? Very, very simply, splitting is a primitive defense which we all use um, up to the age of about three. We use it in order to cope with a world which is too big for us, which is too much to digest. So a baby is born and the lights are bright, the colors are vivid, the sounds are very, very strong. The, 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 the young child divides people and experiences into bite-sized pieces, good pieces, bad pieces, frightening pieces, nurturing pieces. But by the time we get to about three, we should be able to recognize that the world is both good and bad and that people are good people who sometimes do bad things. What's happening to our children when they are um, uh, coming to an alienation reaction is that in a very, very um, important developmental phase between about eight and 15, where the brain is beginning to organize itself and, and, and develop the important centers, they are being pushed back into the use of psychological splitting. They are um, unconsciously, this is not a conscious thing, but they are unconsciously um, uh, adopting the defense. And what's really happening, although it looks as if they're saying, you know, mum is good and dad is bad, what's really happening is that the defense is, is splitting the sense of self. So just at the point where the sense of self in a child should be growing and should be developing and should be free to, 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 to build strongly, the child is pushed back into an infantile 
regressed state of mind where everything is either good or bad. Now, when that happens and it's not treated, the child's capacity to build strong relationships, to relate effectively to the outside world is severely compromised. And that's why children who don't get an intervention, who don't get help, they seem to do well to begin with because they're relieved of the pressure. But actually when they come to important transition points, perhaps uh, doing their A-levels, going to university, leaving university, they struggle to make those transitions because they don't have the capacity, the relational capacity to navigate it because it's been, it's been interfered with during a, a serious developmental phase. They've been pushed back into a regressive infantile state of mind when they really should be allowed to grow and, and relate to everybody um, uh, in their lives. And how will we perceive this inability to cope with these transitional periods when we're looking at the child? What kind of signs will well, we see? The problem, the problem is that, that when the child first develops or, or adapts or adopts um, the defense of psychological splitting, it relieves them of the pressure. So, so suddenly they've gone from having to try and relate to two parents to only having to relate to one. They appear to choose one parent. But the choice is really uh, an unconscious um, defense. What happens with defenses is they can last a lot longer than they're actually needed. And so the um, behavioral adaptations, which are caused by a defense, in this case, the child withdraws from one parent and relates only to um, the preferred or aligned parent. What happens is that as they get to a stage where they need to draw on relational skills, they're not there. Mm. So a child may try to go to university and drop out in the first term. They may try to start new things, but find it impossible to do. They may curtail their um, experience of the outside world and withdraw. So we get a lot of children who don't have normal social lives, for example, they don't relate to, to their peers in the same way. Or they may um, find themselves in a pattern of relationships where they idealize somebody and then suddenly that person lets them down and so they, they, they demonize them, they throw them away. And so friendship patterns and new beginnings uh, peer group um, experiences become extremely difficult for children in these circumstances. And we find, you know, it, into the late 20s, early 30s, sometimes even in their 40s, um, children are in a situation where they're trying to go out there and relate to people, but they're failing. And so they're withdrawing and they're becoming quite closed and insular. They often come from quite closed and insular families. So the preferred or aligned parent has often got a very inward looking family. So of course that family does nothing to encourage the child to overcome the problem, but welcomes them in and says, look, it's because you're like us, you're one of us, come and be safe with us. And so we get very timid, inward looking, um, generation intergenerational patterns, which um, of course is problematic if people really um, want to live a, a full and healthy life. So parental alienation prevents children from having a full and healthy life? I would say so, yes, certainly from the work that I do. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm working with people who are in their 40s. Uh, one, one person I'm working with is 67. And the patterns of um, withdrawal and fear of the outside world, inability to relate effectively to others are very clear and they're seen generation after generation. And for some people, this is a very, you know, it's a, it's a whole life experience. You mentioned also the much younger age group between the age of eight and I believe you said 15, yes. when the brain is developing. Um, what kind of manifestations of damage might we expect to see from children there? Well, it's my belief, I can't, um, I can't 
I'm not a neuroscientist, so I, I, I don't have the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of background to be able to make any claims, but it's my belief that actually what's happening to these children is that the over-reliance on the amygdala, which is the fight, flight, or freeze part of the brain, which is the largest part of the brain between the age of eight and about 15, that is um, a, a, a process um, by which children are being, they're being um, forced into a situation where the time when they would already be the most anxious, the most self-conscious, the most worried, the most um, uh, hypervigilant is being escalated because they are in a situation where they're trying to relate to two different experiences in their life. So if you think about um, what it's like to be at mum's house and then what it's like to be at dad's house, um, for some children in this age group, making that transition back and forth can be very difficult and for some children particularly those who have parents who lean on them or leak information um, uh, or, or, or are quite um, anxious who enmesh their children the movement back and forth even psychologically can be absolutely impossible to achieve and when that starts to happen there is an escalation of dependency on the amygdala the child grows more anxious than they already are and they're unable to achieve normal interactions um, on e each side of their families and it becomes easier for them to raise the defense and just say there's something wrong with mom or there's something wrong with dad and I don't want to do that anymore which again which identifies very very clearly for us what's going on in the child's head but back to the original question which was what are the manifestations of that we might see in children i mean do they get into bad moods do they are they do they become aggressive or do they do they involve themselves in self-harming do they get depressed what, what kind of things do you see it depends on the child um you would see a range of behaviors in every situation that I've worked in there are spectrums of behaviors from the mild to the extreme. Um, many children who uh, are entering into this process towards splitting will begin to show um, a behavior that we call compartmentalization which is where they will be with one parent and then as they move to the other parent, they leave everything um, with that parent behind. They compartmentalize that experience and they leave it behind. And when they arrive here at the other parent's house, um, it is as if that house, that experience doesn't exist. That's compartmentalization. The next stage on from that is switching. The switching child is sometimes called the chameleon child. If I put two parents in a room of a child who is using switching, they will describe a different child to me. It will be as if there are two children or more in that one child um, uh, presentation. So switching is when a child will behave with one parent as if um, uh, they are one way and they will um, placate that parent and they will seek that parent's favor and then when they move across to the other parent they will do exactly the same with that parent but they will seek to placate that parent and give them what they need now unfortunately children who use switching can often trigger a family war because they can they can as a process of trying to ingratiate themselves they can they can say things about this parent to that parent and then when they get back to this parent they can say things to this parent about that parent and that's what I would call an accidental alienation situation in which the child cannot cope with the transitions back and forth um, and begins themselves to try and find a way to please each parent. Now usually the onset of any of these behaviours, compartmentalization, switching or splitting, is caused by a parent putting pressure on the child. You got to, if you think about um, if you think about psychological splitting, if you think about 
the child self being split. I always think that it's the child splits because the pressure upon them becomes so great that they can't do anything else. So my job is to go into the family system and find out where that pressure is coming from. And it's usually coming from either deliberate, conscious patterns of behavior, which are creating um, uh, loyalty conflicts in the child, unconscious transgenerational patterns of behavior, um, which are being passed in the family system without any um, malicious intent, although the, in, the intent becomes malign, um, or the, the impact is malign, um, or there can be a cross pressure um, where both parents are competing. Um, there's a cr sometimes cross alignments where the child feels as if they're being pulled one way or another, but usually in the most severe cases where the child splits completely and refuses to see one parent, what we see is a parent who is influencing, who has some kind of personality uh, profile of concern. And I want to move on uh, now to what we do about those kind of people. They've been described by previous guests on this program as people who will willingly weaponize their child simply to upset the other parent without regard for the damage that that is doing to the child. But as the targeted parent, the man or the woman whose child comes over to visit, and whilst the child is there, they're taking photographs inside all the doors, they're stealing any diamond rings, they're, uh, uh, they're going through their emails and forwarding the court documents back to the other party. There are constant text messages to say the child has, I've signed the child up for soccer now, so you've got to take them to the other side of the country for this club that's on today. And all of these kinds of interruptions. As a lot of our parents say to us, how am I supposed to stay sane with all this stuff going on around me and have any kind of normal relationship with my child, especially where my child is being openly hostile to me and all I can do is bite my lip because I don't have any authority with which to discipline the child. Indeed. Um, one of the, um, I would say, partly conscious um, strategies which are being used in these situations is to um, dysregulate or disempower, to erase the sense of, of um, being a parent from um, that parent's uh, consciousness. So this is not just about um, impacting on the child's sense of self this is about impacting on the other parent's sense of self but i would say that um yes yes children are weaponized there's no doubt about it but whether that's done consciously and deliberately um or whether that's done as a pattern of um maladaptive behaviors which are handed on down the family line that's something that we as um, psychotherapists, as people who work in these, these cases, we have to find that out because not all cases are the same. Although we have very similar outcomes and very similar presentations in children, the etiology of the child's behavior, the causation of the child's behavior can be very different. And one of the things that we always say is, is we caution parents, don't jump to conclusions, just like um, if we were investigating um, a crime, we can't make assumptions, we have to find the evidence. And once we find the evidence of what's happening, then we can do something about it. But to go to your point, the helplessness and the hopelessness that, that parents who are rejected experience is a real thing and it is part of the pattern of behaviors and i would say that to 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 um disinvest or to, to strip that parent of their sense of agency and their sense of um being a parent is a sort of it, it, it's added value for um the parent to whom the child is aligned my test is always when I'm working in situations with um, aligned parents, you know, they often say to me, oh, I, I wish that, that they would see 
their daddy or their 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 mummy if only he or she would and i say okay well let's see what we can do about that and i test that statement by making sure that mummy or daddy does whatever it is that, that the aligned parent is saying should be done and then when the child continues the rejecting behaviors then i can hold up the mirror to that parent and say well look here's the reality you said if only they would well they already have and the child still continues with that behavior so what are we going to do now um, so we have to we have to test the parent we have to rely on the evidence but when we get the evidence of what's really happening then we um, as people who do this work we have to come into the family and we have to get um, an external framework which stops what's happening as quickly as possible um, in order to protect the child and to reconnect the child to the um, rejected parent because and here's the thing because that parent holds a very important piece of the jigsaw puzzle of that child's health and what many people around the world who campaign against the concept of alienation do not understand is that the parent in the rejected position holds that key holds that piece of the jigsaw and that child will not be able to integrate a full sense of self until they've been able to connect with the parent again and receive that important piece of the jigsaw and that goes for whether the child is six or 60. it is not until the reconnection happens and the child can reconnect to their their full identity that integration um, occurs for the child and I think that for me is something that we have to those of us who do this work who campaign about this work who think about children in these circumstances we have to get that reality known because so many children over so many years have lived without being able to connect with that sense of themselves um, and it leaves a constant sense of unfinished business and until children are able to finish the business of identity and reintegrate they're going to be left in limbo um, like too many children have been okay so we 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 can see that um parental alienation can be described clinically using different terms and you specifically mentioned the words um um, where did I drop them down now? Um, in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, the psychoanalytical approach, evidence based. Um... Psychological splitting and primitive defenses are the key words. Okay, and that's the that's the clinical way to describe parental alienation as we know. So, well, it's only one way. Look, I've just been yeah. I've just been on a call with. But, a but for judges and people like that who you know have heard all of the reasons why parental alienation is a bad thing and and has to be dis, dispensed with in court because uh, people use parental alienation as a means of hiding actual abuse that they're doing and as a defense for it and therefore it should be i mean it's a it's a bit of a nonsense argument really because it's like saying that uh, you know anybody that kept, comes to court and and confesses to manslaughter is just using it as an excuse to hide uh, murder and it's much more serious and therefore i mean really it's up to the judge to be and a professional judge should clearly see through it and therefore regardless of what you call it, it it's the same thing but we can see from what you've said karen that it does multi-generational damage in as much as you know the kids are still suffering this at the age of 60 by when of course they have their own kids Indeed. um you talk in one of your lectures, I heard about building a path for the child to come back to you. So as an alienated parent, I'm aware of the damage that my child is being abused, whether you call it parental alienation or, or use uh, the, the correct terminology in psych psychological terms. The courts cannot help me because either they don't recognize it they don't like the sound of it. They're prejudiced against it. They don't, they, they just don't understand what's going on. And as you said at the very outset, sure aren't the kids being fed. They have a roof over their head. They're all going to school. 
they'll be grand. Mm. Um, now I'm a parent with that child I mentioned earlier on comes over stealing the, the diamond rings and uh, takes forwarding my email, all that stuff. How do I build that path for my child to come back to me and disabuse themselves of the nastiness that has been seeded in their head by the other parent, if I'm the alienated um, parent. What, this path, I'm, I'm very keen to just- Okay, well, look, there's no, there's no one path. Every, everybody who has been in the rejected parent position has to build their own unique path because each path, um, which, which really is the treatment route that the child needs, is built of the dynamics which have caused the child to enter into the split state of mind in the first place. So each path is unique. However, there are principles, real principles. And I can take you through um, this, the, the sort of broad principles of um, the, the, the work that we, we do with families. The first principle is the splitting in the child has been projected outwards and the purpose of the splitting is to keep people away from the child and allow the child to maintain the split state of mind because that feels safe for the child. However, the projection of the split causes you as a parent to become destabilized. Either you become very angry, you become very despairing. Some parents tragically take their own lives. Um, they are driven into a place of despair. The reality of the path home is that if you are not there in a good sound psychological frame of mind no path that you build will lead to anything for the child so you must begin by reconfiguring your view of yourself away from um, a position of the of the hopeless helpless parent and and you must sit yourself into the understanding that you are the parent who will ultimately provide for the child the healing that they need. You have to really begin to think about your child as a different child. It's like um, children who, you know, when, when we didn't know about autism, when we didn't know about ADHD, um, those children were, were seen as having problems but they were not properly understood. The children that we're working with are seen to have problems, but they're not properly understood. You, as the rejected parent, have the opportunity to properly understand what's happening to your child. And you have the opportunity to understand that you may not be able to intervene now, but there will be a time when you can and you must be ready to do that. And you must be able to show your child that you're there and healthy and well. So your first task is to learn how to regulate your own self, to learn how to stay open to your parenting and your parenthood, but to learn how to regulate yourself. If you still have a child who is coming to you, stealing diamond rings and so on and so forth, then you have to learn that what you um, must do, first of all, for that child is, is recognize that their psychological self is not the same as any other child. It's not the same as a child who steals. It's not the same as a child um, who is grieving. It's not the same as a child with, with autism or ADHD. It's a child suffering from psychological splitting, which means that the child has two, at least two distinct parts to their consciousness. One part which is a false self, and one part which is their authentic self. And the authentic self never leaves them, always loves you. And if you work in the right way with that child, you can bring the authentic self to the surface. Now, a child who steals diamond rings, let's take that as an example. Our natural inclination with a child who steals is to raise that, uh, bring that to their attention and is to set consequences. We, we often are driven to use shame-based consequences. You can't use shame-based consequences 
with children who are using split thinking because they are already very ashamed and they have just split that off and, and, and that's in their unconscious. If you try to shame them in this situation, they will simply walk away from you and they won't come back. What you have to do is use logical consequences. And the logical consequences speak to the authentic child. Look, my diamond rings aren't safe around you. So everything's gonna be locked up. I'm not gonna allow you to have free reign of the house because things are disappearing. So things are gonna be locked up. And you might have to lose some privileges because things are not safe around you. Logical consequences rather than shame-based consequences are important if you're still seeing um, your children. So the first part of it is to sit yourself right in the role of healthy parent and to recognize that that is absolutely where you need to be. The second thing that you need to do is learn how to mentalize your child's experience. So mentalization is the capacity to see life through your child's eyes or see life through somebody else's eyes, but, but we're, we're, considered, we're concerned with, with your child's experience. When you can mentalize your child's experience, which means that you can visualize what they've been through in the you know, hours before they arrived at your house or the, the days before they went into a, a fully rejecting state of mind, then you, you get a 360 degree view of the dynamics around the child. When you get that 360 degree view, it helps you to know when to step forward and when to step back. Because a child who is coming to you, having been, you know, had their ear full of poison, is gonna need some time on their own, I would say, um, in their own room to, to decompress, to decontaminate before they come into your company. So one of the things that we say, of course, is um, if your child is still coming to you and you know that there is um, you know, deliberate, uh, excuse me, or, or, or any level of influence going on with the child, when they come through the door, allow them to have at least a couple of hours to decompress and decontaminate and allow them to come to you rather than you go to them and expect them to relate to you straight away. Mentalizing their experience means that they get from you something that they're not getting from the other parent and that allows them to manage some of the worst of what's, what's happening to them. We're getting a lot of calls in, Karen, on this yes. particular point from parents who say that's great if you see your kid. But, yes. you know, yes. my, yes. my kid's already gone. I haven't yes. seen my kid for 20 years. I haven't seen them for yes. six months, whatever it happens to be. There's not they feel there's absolutely nothing they can do because they've no contact. Right. Well, there's lots okay. you can do. There's an awful lot you can do. Don't never, ever, ever think that because you've got no contact, um, there's nothing you can do. I've been working with a group. In, um, in my holding up a healthy mirror course. And uh, one, one dad who hasn't had any contact with his, his son for five years um, is about to meet with his son at, at, um, at, his, uh, at, at the grandmother's house on Friday um, using a strategy um, which we you know, teach parents to use at the clinic. One thing that you must know and you really must take this in, in the rejected parent position, is that, that, that alienated children can, can hear round corners. They can hear and see round corners. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you think they're not looking, but I can tell you each and every one of the, let's say, I think it's about 75 severely alienated children that I've worked with in the past few years, by severely alienated, I mean people who, kids who have made serious allegations of murder, rape, abuse, all sorts of stuff. I've interviewed every one of those children after they've been reunited with the parent. And I say to them, when you were not seeing your parent, and particularly when you were making allegations about them, did you go looking for them? And every one of them said, yes, 
I always knew where my parent was and I was always looking. Some of them say, of course, I pretended to myself that I wasn't, but it's like I've got, you know, this box that I can, I can, I can do it, but I can put it over there. You must be aware that, that your children are driven by um, biological um, imperatives to be with you, to see you, to know who you are. They want to look at your face. They want to hear your voice. They go looking. So you've got to be ready with your online presence. You've got to be ready and you've got to know that what they're looking for is a healthy parent because they know that they're not being cared for by a healthy parent. But what if they are? What if it's a case, and I'm thinking of one in particular, where um, a, 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 a father and a mother were boyfriend and girlfriend and split up, and several months later, the, the, the girl discovered she was going to have a child, and because the father had left, or for whatever reason, she decided, well, I'm going to make sure he never sees that child. And the child is now 30, has never met the father, has never spoken to the father. The father has written once a month, every single month, saying who he is and what he's doing and how much he misses the child. Um, he, you know, they, they've contacted aunties, uncles, grandparents, everybody to try and, you know, convince the mother to let the child be introduced to its father. And 30 years later, he's, think, he's thinking, maybe I've got my own mental health. I've got to put my own oxygen mask on first here. This is just, you know, it's destroyed my life for 30 years. Am I going to keep going? What is the point of it all? Maybe I need to just try and forget I've ever had a child. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible feeling to have for anyone I can only imagine, but I can also understand it. Absolutely. And many parents say to me, if I just had an on off switch for my parenting, my life would be complete because I would just switch it off right now and then I wouldn't have to feel these feelings. Mm. Look, in those circumstances, the child has been brought up in a situation um, where we, we don't know what the mother has said about the child, but perhaps we can guess that the, 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 the atmosphere around the child has not been hugely supportive. But I've worked with a lot of children in these circumstances um, where they have never had um, an actual relationship with, a, with a, a, a parent. They never knew the parent in childhood. But just like adopted children, just like children who are adopted at birth, the urge to know your heritage is huge. So what can this dad do? Well, my experience in these circumstances is if he stops pursuing and simply stands in the same place and perhaps he posts his messages in appropriate terms online um, if he does that the child then has the opportunity to go looking and they do go looking because these children are very very like adopted children their psychology is very similar to adopted children, which is why we use therapeutic parenting um, to help alienated parents, because it's a very translatable um, uh, skill. So I would say in those circumstances, he has to stop pursuing because the, the pursuit possibly makes the mother and family too anxious and stand still and let the child find him i think he's been he would probably have been standing still for 30 years and the child hasn't found me yet what's going to change yeah well the difference is this um if he has been writing to the child then he's not just writing to the child he's writing to the mother too you know this is being shared this will be shared by the whole family well, it's fair to assume that the mother may well in, intercept the messages and be possibly. the only one who never sees them possibly but look, this is the other principle. In, in intractable situations like that, you must think like this. If I always do what I've always done, I'll always get what I've always got. I have to try something different to give the dynamics in the family an opportunity to do something different. And this is, this is the way that we work at the clinic. You know, we work with a, um, a 
a whatever works principle and we work with the understanding that we are all of us driven by innate biological needs to know who we are and you know not not every adopted child goes looking but many many adopted children want to know their origins need to know their roots often when they come to have children of their own they're pushed out um, to go and look and in these circumstances as you describe that's that's the kind of um, approach that I would take because it's very similar to adoption. Okay, so back off uh, and stop stand sending. Stand still, stand still, stand still. Don't, don't, standing still doesn't mean do nothing. S create a small space online, you know, use um, terminology that, that, that makes it easy for you to be found. Think about things that the child may know about you. You know, if you, if you can't know what the child knows, you've got to imagine, you've got to mentalize, you've got to try and think it through to get a sense of what might be possible. Wow, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, so let's say I'm a social worker, Karen, and I uh, am brought in to intervene in a family where the court has determined there is parental alienation going on and they don't know what to do. And I walk in and, uh, and I meet uh, a very hostile, let's say, father who's there with the two little kiddies who are hanging on to his legs. They're terrified. They won't uh, leave their dad under any circumstances. They tell the social worker, I really hate my mom. I just don't want to see her ever again. Where does that social worker start to break it down? Well, look, social workers are the perfect people to do this work. And, and, you know, my dream is that that one day before too long, this will be the realm of social workers and I won't have to do this anymore. And certainly um, as, as time goes on, I'm training more and more social workers in more and more countries. So social workers are perfectly placed because they're very used to working in child protection. So if the child was clinging onto daddy's leg and daddy had been known to have physically hurt the child or sexually abused the child, the social worker would not have any problem in saying, well, I know you don't wanna leave daddy, but you're going to have to. What the social worker needs to recognize is that the psychological and emotional harm which is caused by psychological splitting is very serious and it's long lasting if it's not prevented if it's not treated Addressed, yeah. and there's a very very easy way to treat it the child needs to be separated first from the parent who is causing the induced psychological splitting so if we were in a situation where we were going to do some some work with a a, a child Wait, sorry the... Karen when you say separated are you talking about residential transfer no 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 I'm talking about residential transfer is one way of doing it but but before you ever get to that point, what you would do is you would have dad bring the children to, let's say, the family centre. And dad leaves the children with the social worker and the social worker allows a, a, a decontamination period of, let's say, an hour where the children are just able to play. Um, the children are able to have juice, biscuits, whatever, and the social worker connects with them. After that period of time, then mum comes along and with the social worker present, mum comes into the room and the social worker observes the children's behaviours because that first connection gives us a lot of information about what's been done to the children. You know, are they cowering? If they are cowering, is it a genuine seeming fear or is it put on? Um, you assess the child's response. Younger children, children up to the age of about maybe 10 or 11, will often warm up very quickly and connect with the parent in what we call, this is what we call protected space. So it's, it's a, um, a completely uh, safe place, which is, is monitored and patrolled by the social worker. Dad can't come in and they can spend their time with mom 
Now, if that goes well, then children can go back to dad, but you would escalate the time that the children spend with the mum next time, and next time has to be within two or three days, not a week, not two weeks, but two or three days, to a whole afternoon. And then it would be um, a whole day. And you would do that very, very quickly. Now, if the children can tolerate that, and if the father doesn't breach the boundary that the social worker puts in place by poisoning the children um, more when they, they get back to him, then you can continue that process and you can rebuild relationships in that way. But if there is repeated breach and re repeated breakthrough um, from the father in those circumstances so that the children are seen to get worse rather than, they, than get better, then you would need to think about um, uh, disguised compliance, i.e. the father is behaving as if he is engaged when in fact he's not. The father is simply repeating behaviours um, rather than learning to change behaviours. He's not supporting the um, problem rather than um, uh, getting in there and, and helping the children to move forward. That's when you would start to think about um, whether or not the children need a longer period away from, from dad. Um, and you would start to think about structuring a change of residence. We, have, uh, we just got a, 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 a viewer saying, in my instance, the social worker just set up meetings with my daughter. They did not facilitate. My daughter would turn up and sit there in silence until the allocated time expired and go back yeah. to the... Uh, and that's a real uh, shame. That's a real shame. The, the social worker has to recognise that they have to play an active role, just as they would with physical abuse, just as they would with sexual abuse. They have to play an active role. Um, and when they do that, we see significant changes. And, you know, I'm working in the in the High Court in Dublin at the moment. We've got at least one judge over there, two judges, as far as I know, who get it. Um, and um, this approach I think is is something that could easily be embedded into um, uh, social work practice, particularly as you've got your Ministry of Justice um, looking at the issue of alienation. It doesn't have to be, this, the, the, the point that I'm making is it doesn't have to be a specialist like me that does this work because it is the holding of the power and the management of the power over the child, which is the determining factor. It is the capacity to protect the child and constrain the behaviours of the influencing parent, which makes the difference. And what about cases where, for instance, you may well find, as you have, a couple of judges that get it. You may well find a couple of um, uh, social workers indeed who are like the ones attending this uh, lecture this evening um, who are genuinely interested care about it and want to do something but there is a, a silent majority out there in of legal professionals who in whose financial interests it is not to understand any of this um, and judges who are told well we've done a report on the voice of the child and what that child feels is that they definitely do not want to see their mom they don't want to go back they don't want to stay in their house the child is now 13 your honor they're old enough to to vote with their feet we can't deny them that uh, uh, ability so uh, or that right uh, it's a freedom for the child now they're old enough to make their own mind up mm -hmm. how does that person number one you know assess whether or not the legal team that unfortunately they must engage to get into court um to uh, uh represent them is actually sincerely interested in the child and has an understanding appropriate to a court situation when it comes to parental alienation and number two how can that professional finding themselves before one of the majority of judges who doesn't get parental alienation and doesn't understand it and doesn't really want to know about it in fact 
we've had a, a judge on on one of our previous programs tell us that uh, you know um, family law is generally seen by judges as the the bottom rung of the ladder it's where they start you off a, a, as a judge and everybody has to go through it as a form of penance rather than it being a vocation which again is something which is being addressed globally i know but it ain't there yet so for today, we've got kids. They, we get. We need to find a lawyer who understands parental alienation. We need to be able to tell whether they do and whether that and its attack is their motivation. And we need to assess whether or not they can convince a judge that what they're talking about is a form of child abuse, needs to be seriously addressed with such things as you've recommended, the interventional intervention of social workers who are appropriately trained and or residential transfer. Look, I think what we've got to do is this. Um, I have great respect for judges because I work in the family courts and the family courts are hierarchical. And I know that we need a hierarchy, a working, functioning, effective hierarchy in the family in order to be able to treat and restabilize the family system. Because what's happened in these circumstances is the family hierarchy has collapsed, often purposefully. It's been, it's been broken by the influencing parent either consciously and deliberately or unconsciously but one way or another it's collapsed and we have to scaffold that back into place I can't do that on my own I have to have a judge who understands it who can give us the composite orders the effective detailed orders that allow us to go in and do the scaffolding work and I respect judges and listen I've had hard time um at the hands of judges. Anybody who follows my work will recognize that as much as, as, much as High Court um, judgments have praised my work, I've also had lower court judges who haven't understood, who have scapegoated me, who have blamed me for things that have gone wrong. Judges are human, like everybody else. They are not descended from the gods. They are human, like everyone else, and they need to hear this issue spoken about simply but compellingly in ways that do not re-trigger the he said, she said, you know, binary dilemma. And one of the easiest ways of doing that is to quit using parental alienation completely and to speak to the judge about psychological, emotional and psychological harm and the red flag of induced psychological splitting, which is the division of parents into good and bad. Children who are abused by their parents do not completely reject them. Only in very, very extreme circumstances do children display that, that outright rejection. Children who were abused by their parents often want their parents to change. And I know that because I've worked with children who have been seriously sexually and otherwise abused by their children. And I've had to stop them seeing a parent, even though they wanted desperately to see that parent. So we know that when the red flag of psychological splitting is flying, that this is a child in trouble. We don't need to use the term parental alienation. We can describe so, it. So that you've raised that a couple of times, Karen. So you, are you are you saying that the term parental alienation is now, uh, you know, it's it's a, a persona non grata? And, no, and I'm just saying it's unnecessary. I'm just saying it's unnecessary. So look, I'm in front of a judge in Dublin at the moment. I haven't used the term parental alienation. There's no need to. It's so value laden, it's so full of controversy that if I used the term parental alienation, I would just end up arguing it does it exist, does it not exist, is it right, is it wrong? What there's no point in going in that direction. Whereas psychological splitting is a well documented. If acceptance. you go, if you if you say to a judge, look, Your Honor, or your however you, you address the judge, look. The child is, is, is clearly dividing their feelings into wholly good and wholly bad. The child is, is contemptuous of the parent that they're rejecting. The child is acting without empathy. The research evidence, the clinical literature tells us that a child only 
Salvador Manuchin, who's the father of family therapy, said, a child only ever looks down on a parent when they're standing on the shoulders of the other, which basically means unless a child is given permission or is being encouraged or enabled or allowed to denigrate a parent and be contemptuous, it is not a natural approach for a child to take. They don't do it. They only behave in that way if they are being supported to, encouraged to, enabled to do that by the other parent. And so you have to explain to the judge that this is something which, if it's occurring now, there will be long-term consequences for the child. The child doesn't have to have, you know, a 50-50 relationship with each parent. The child has to be able to identify with each parent, has to have the freedom to relate to each parent over their lifetime, because that's the way the child holds an integrated state of mind. So education for judges is absolutely vital. Now, the issue of, um, you know, do people- Do you not find judges receptive to being educated in this? Yes, yes, I do, I do, okay. I do. All over the world, in fact, judges are um, receptive to, to um, education. They, they are interested, they are focused, they know that this phenomenon, this display of behaviours happens because they see it in their courtroom and they want to understand how can it be prevented, how can it be treated and what do they need to do in order to assist in that treatment. And well, uh, presumably, given the level of controversy that you've already mentioned, which is associated with the, the term, at least, uh, parental alienation, the judge, the first dilemma a judge, a sincere, genuine judge who wants to get his head around this thing has to make is how do I know the source is credible? How do they do that? Where do they go? I mean, it's not, there's no manual on this. It's not in the, uh, uh, what, what is it, the list of psychological disorders that they can look up. It's not in the DSM. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be in the DSM. It doesn't need to be in the ICD-11. All of those things, in my How view, can a judge know that whoever is telling them about uh, psychological splitting or parental alienation is a recognised source and a credible source and not one of the many cranks like, uh, like many parents end up it's, being accused of? It's um, really... Look, this is really, really difficult. One of the things that parents are very vulnerable to is being preyed upon by people who don't understand what they're talking about um, or people who believe that they understand what they're talking about and hook parents into a treatment route, which ultimately fails. And then they, they blame the parent for it failing. Yeah. That's one of my big sort of bugbears, really. And, and it, it, it's why I work with colleagues in the International Academy. Um, but how do judges know? Well, over here, um, I've been working in this, this field as an expert witness for about 15 years. I only work in the high courts at the moment. Um, my work in a particular case recently has been published. So the evidence for um, the input and the intervention is there for everybody to read. Um, I would say, that many judges are cautious about who they trust. I've had um, some judges who have challenged me and um, who have given me a hard time, but ultimately under cross-examination, um, they've accepted my evidence. And I think it's, it's, it's having an expert who is able to evidence their success um, point to other people who they have helped um, and having a background in the clinical literature so being able to talk to the judge not about you know five factor models or the signs of alienation um, but to be able to root that in the clinical literature to go back to Bowlby to go back to Winnicott to be able to explain what's happening to the child from a clinical perspective, and then to be able to describe what needs to happen um, in order to create change 
and then provide a treatment route which is then followed and reported upon, that's the measure of the quality that we need to be looking for um, in, in um, evidence giving and treatment. There's far too many people can describe alienation, but when it comes to the point of describing how to treat it, they've got no idea at all. But there's, so still, there's still a job out there for somebody to write a book on parental alienation. This is what it is. Somebody with a PhD in psychology uh, and psychotherapy and, and whatever, whatever the requisites. Well, there are many, there are many books, um, Ken, on, on parental alienation, many, many books. But are there, are there credible academic ones that we could refer to a judge, for instance? Um, I think there are a number of, of papers. Certainly what I'm finding um, over uh, in Dublin is, if you refer people to the Family Separation Clinic website, where we've got a lot of resources, a lot of writing, um, which is rooted in the clinical literature, the judges, you know, are very comfortable with the background information that we're that we're providing. Can I have the URL, please, for the Family Separation Clinic website? Yes. Um, uh, I've actually got a slide and it should come up um, towards the end. But Paul, it's... have you got the slides there for Karen that uh, she mentioned earlier? I think she sent a couple in. If you Paul, could if you, if, put them up on screen. The, um, if you've got the slide for the course, the holding up a healthy mirror course. So it's the next slide, not that one. So that's the website. And this is a uh, this is just um, describe. It's just about the course that I'm running. Um, it's a rolling course. It's called holding holding up a healthy mirror, and it's it's the fundamentals of therapeutic parenting. Um, I've got two running at the moment, and it begins again on May the third. Um, therapeutic parenting, as I said, um, is really rooted in uh, adoption, fostering and adoption. Um, but we have translated that into uh, parenting for um, alienated children. And it, it's very effective. It works very well. There are huge expenses, presumably associated with professionals like yourself, when it comes to undertaking these kind of costs, though. Well, uh, we try to keep important. things as we think, try to keep things as, as, as uh, 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 cheap as possible, because we know that um, parents are just overwhelmed by the costs involved yeah. so if i give you an example this course costs 180 pounds but that gives you eight hours of time with me across a month it also gives you additional recording in a class situation presumably in a class situation yeah but it gives you two hours at uh, two extra recordings to watch on your own and it also gives you a wealth of, of um, uh, handouts, uh, uh, articles, and information that you can use in your own case. And what we're doing in, in therapeutic parenting is um, we are uh, really helping people to build that road home. We're helping them to look at their case from a strategic perspective, to work out what do they need to do to maximize the um, opportunity that the child might have to get home and to look at that inside the court process and outside of it. So we look at how to build your court strategy as well as how to work directly um, with your child in every way that you can, um, you can find. Super, well thank you for that um, and uh, that's, that sounds a reasonable uh, expense in light of the expertise one might dream um we're, we're we're coming to the end karen we've got to finish at 7 30 so uh i wanted to get around to one or two of the many thousand questions that have come in um but before i move on one of the ways that uh, has been attempted in the past to simplify the whole parental alienation dynamic for uh the judiciary and professionals involved is to uh, create things like uh, Jennifer Harmon's uh, five-factor model that you mentioned earlier on. Um, and William Barnett has done uh, similar types of work, both uh, previous guests on the programme as well. Um, 
do you 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 te- you sounded like you are not a big fan of the five factor model type approach is that fair to say um i'm not sure that i would say i'm not a big fan i just don't find it helpful in treatment um so i used to be involved um in the parental alienation studies group i left in 2019 largely because i'd gone as far as it with five factors and eight signs if you try to work with the concept of parental alienation and five factors with a child it simply drives the defense in the child up higher it takes you nowhere and i had i come from a psychoanalytic background anyway so my original training was with dr hamish cameron who was a child adolescent psychiatrist and his his um, formulations about why a child was rejecting were very much rooted in psychoanalysis and in the five factor model i realized that i wasn't i was neither learning anything nor could i contribute anything because i'm not interested in proving whether or not parental alienation exists i know it exists I'm interested in treating it. I'm interested in preventing it. I'm interested in raising consciousness about the harm it does to children. And so for me, stepping out of that and back into my roots, psychoanalysis, structural therapy, enabled me to really um, shift gear and and start to to think about how to develop wider uh, uh, groups of, of clinicians who can come to the coalface and do the work. Ideally, and we're very, very fortunate because we have um, some investment from Sweden to help us to do this. Ideally, we're going to get upstream and help people to prevent splitting, to prevent this problem from occurring. But I'm realistic. Alienation is a problem with a human face. It is a human family relational problem. And, and that that we have to deal with. And those humans questions, I promise to get to the ones who have this sure. human face, Karen, as you so eloquently sure, sure. describe it. What, I mean, this is a classic kind of a question. Karen, do you advise the rejected parent to continue to make phone calls to a nine-year-old child even when the child says, don't call me, I don't want to talk to you. And this is said every single phone call. Um, What I would say is if there is a different way of setting up communication. um, So for example, if you can zoom with the child and rather than try to have a conversation, actually introduce some games online to the child, that's a much, much better approach. If you find yourself in a situation where you're having to have verbal communication with an alienated child, it is um, it's agony. It's like pulling teeth and it just becomes a, 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 a ping pong game of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And you soon lose hope. What I would advise is if you can find a different platform to have contact instead of asking questions, instead of um putting yourself through that agony just see if you can get some online games going because listen it's the proximity that the child has to you which draws their felt sense to the surface their memory of you to the surface and it's that which pulls them back towards you and even if all you can do is kind of fish them out of the um, fog once a week with a game of whatever online then you are dropping a small antidote into a sea of of poison and if you can do that it's really really important especially for a nine-year-old because a nine-year-old is just at the beginning of the developmental you know phase in the in the brain and and you know they need to be kept on the um on the hook of of connectedness to that parent and 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 when you know presume the 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 the, uh, the natural extension of that last question is when the child comes over and they're openly rude and abusive to you when they arrive um 
you cannot address that. You've already told us with uh, guilt by saying, well, that's not a very nice way to speak to daddy or that's not the right way to speak to your mommy because you've suggested that won't work. How would you uh, employ the logical way of explaining it that you suggested might be appropriate? So a child comes over and a child is rude to you. And what you say to the child is, look, I can hear that you are angry. I can hear that you are frustrated. There's something going on. I can hear it. I can feel it. But I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to be the person that you throw this stuff at. I know it's difficult for you. I'm going to go in the kitchen. I'm going to start cooking tea. I'm going to start making some food. I'm going to, I'm going to go into my bedroom and read a book. When you're ready, when you're ready to have a conversation, to talk with me, come and find me. And, you know, the child says, you're horrible, you're terrible, and goes into their room and bangs the door. That's fine. Leave them there. Let them decontaminate. You've got to think of your children in these circumstances as coming through the door with a coat full of the poison that's been poured over them by the other parent. They need time to get rid of it. They, you can't pull it off them. They have to decontaminate themselves. Yeah, you've mentioned that before as well. And of course, it's very difficult when you haven't seen your child for maybe a month and they arrive and you're so excited and you have all the, you know, you've got the dinner cooked, you've got the house ready, you've got the room all done up with a new pillow and you're so, and then this little monster arrives and yes. you, you, all you feel like doing is going into your room and crying and sending the yes. child back and say, look, it's just, it's, it's just too heartbreaking. We have another one, Karen, here, which is very interesting. Um, what do you do when the father doesn't see the problem and does not want to help the child in moving on? The father is hanging on and keeps speaking with the child about what is difficult. So this is a circumstance where the child presumably is seeing both parents. I, well, I, I don't know is the answer to that, but it, it's a case where clearly the father uh, is continuing to emotionally attach himself to the child and needs the child and uh, emotionally for his own selfish purposes and is therefore uh, not uh, capable of seeing the fact that he's actually parentally alienated that child from its mother and is causing the child great harm he thinks he's just loving the child and the child ah, okay loves. and I think somebody's just come on there and said yes yes um, this is in a situation where okay so look first of all you recognize that in these circumstances the child is likely to be drawn into um, um, an over identification with the father because what he's doing is he, he's guilt tripping he's enmeshing the child into his own grief what you do, you absolutely do not um, uh, try to explain to the child that what the father is doing wrong uh, is wrong. What you do is show the child that you have empathy for their father, because um, if you show that there is empathy for, their, for the father, that it reduces the child's need to take care of the father and what we really want to do is make sure that children are not parentified so they're not put in a place where they have to take care of a parent so for a time even though you might hate this because you you know the relationship's ended you want to move on you just wish you'd get over himself so that so that he could move on for a time around your child you may need to show more empathy than you actually feel for the father um, in order to prevent the child from becoming parentified because it's the juxtaposition of the father's grief and the mother's um, a, a appearance to the child of, of, of not caring about the father's grief that, that pushes the, the child towards the father. Remember, children are like little weather vanes. They particularly in divorce and separation, it's like they've got radar going all the time on their, on their heads. And if they perceive that a parent is struggling, a parent is in trouble, they will do everything and anything that they possibly can to try and regulate that, that parent and, and take care. So you may need to have to, you may- Wait, What do you mean regulate and take care? You mean if they see a parent uh, as being 
uh, down on their luck, they will feel the need to put a hand out and help them. Yeah, to soothe them, to care for them, to parent them, to to so, see. So like... one doesn't have to pretend to be stoic and at all times everything's just fine. Um, no, we don't want parents to be stoic and, and, and pretend that things are all fine. But what we do want is for parents to recognise that their children are, are highly attuned to their feelings and that even if you feel and believe that you are sealing that off from a child, the child experiences life in a symbolic way. They don't experience you know, verbal life in a verbal way quite so much but they they're like sponges they absorb feelings so in the situation that's being described you as the as the mother in this um, situation you need to apply an antidote to what the father is doing the father is enmeshing and so to prevent the child from when you when you say enmeshing, that's embroiling the child. In yes, the... so enmeshing is sort of drawing the child into his psychology. You know, he's he's he, it, it, unfortunately it's a, not a very nice word to use, but it's incestuous. It's an incestuous, um, seductive pulling of the child. Come to me because I'm. I'm struggling and I wish we were all together and it would be so nice if we could be all together. Come to me. And, uh, and the child who um, experiences their mother in that situation as being, you know, oh, just tell him to get on with it because he's, he's just been stupid, will often try to compensate for what they perceive to be missing from the mother. Now, if mother says, look, I know daddy's really sad and it's really not easy. Um, and I hope that, you know, things can get better for daddy. I, I really do. And, and they will get better for him. Um, we need to, you know, you need to remember that life, your life is your life and so on. You get much, much better results for the child than if, you know, mum says, oh, for goodness sake, he's just trying to persuade you to to see life yeah. through his eyes. Now, we know that what he's doing is wrong. We don't want him to do it. Yeah. But we may have to employ a little bit of, of you know, psychological management in order Reverse to... Reverse psychology. Out. Yeah, absolutely. Reverse so psychology. Another, another scenario that uh, we've come across a couple of times, Karen, and I don't know, it's a fairly new phenomenon, so it may, may well be something with which you have no experience, but we've come across a couple of times a situation where a couple have... Uh, used donor eggs to have children and an insecurity develops in the mother uh, because she feels well these children are biologically yours but they're not biologically mine even though I may have given birth to them so I'm going to turf you out the door and make sure the kids hate you because otherwise they mightn't love me enough uh, is that something you've ever come across yes absolutely um it's a pernicious difficult scenario um i've come across it in many different circumstances um circumstances with same-sex parents um donor donor um, yeah, egg, yeah, um uh, uh, and so on and it can become um a, a, a fight to the death um at times it's it can be brutal um because what is being fought over um is really this sort of the ownership of dna um and the threat of not being biologically related to the child is so big that um, it overwhelms sense and sensibility. And the, the sort of sense of, of injustice for, for parents who are biologically um, the parent, but who are kept at distance um, becomes so big that it drives the parent into you know, extreme um, displays of behavior. They're very, very difficult to, um, to untangle. We, we do untangle them, we, we, we do, because working from the child's perspective, we help parents to recognize that yes, this parent may not be biologically related, but this parent has carried the child or this parent has um, uh, uh, donated sperm so that the child can be alive and we we and we connect 
people to the child's lived experience and their need for um, their biological identity as well as their their social identity and the relationships that they have because even if say a mother has carried a child and um, she's not biologically related to that child um, she has still developed those those um, nurturing relationships, uh, uh, tendencies with the child. She still um, developed those feelings with the child and the child has grown in the crucible of only knowing those relationships. So those Sorry, Karen, we're, 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 we, we, we've, about, we've about 60 seconds left. Okay. I have one more question and then I want the details, please, of when you're next holding up a mirror courses, if you have, if you can dig those up for oh, us, because so. um, we've had a number of people ask about that. If the siblings are split and the two eldest are alienated and staying with the dad and three of them have bad influence on the younger ones who stay with the mother, how do you prevent the alienation of the younger ones? Well, look, alienation is a systemic problem, which means that it, it flows through the family. So the older ones have to be kept separate from the younger ones um, in order to be able to uh, uh, effect any kind of um, successful work for a period of time. That doesn't mean to say that they've got to be continuously kept apart, but older children very definitely become um, uh, proxy alienators because this is a very, very infectious um, uh, dynamic and it, it spreads very, very quickly. Okay, we've got a, the last one that's just come in saying holding up a mirror course is great. I did it already. Can you tell us when Good. the next one is available, please? Yes, if Paul, could you put the two slides up um, if we've got time? Because I just want to say to people who are on this call, um, we've got a conference which is being streamed live on the 14th and 15th of June, which has all of this stuff and more with some real, um, uh, really powerful people in the field. You may have heard of them, Benjamin Garber and Barbara Fiddler, um, as well as many other clinicians. Um, what we want to offer to um, uh, people who have been on this course is a 20% discount. I don't think we can see the 20% discount, Paul. If you could just move this slide up a little bit there. Um, you need to go to the IAPAC International website and use the promo code WELCOME to get a 20% discount. I think that brings it down to about £50 a day, and that's two eight-hour days of um, really tightly packed seminars, uh, which are covering all of these, these issues. And then um, if you go on to the Holding Up the Healthy, healthy Mirror, the bookings are open for that now, and it begins again on May the 3rd. And we will put those details up on our own website for you as well, Karen, so that Thank you can easily uh, link to it from there. Um, I'd like to say, wow, fantastic. How insightful. Your best webinar ever. There are some of the message that have, messages that have come in, Karen. Uh, I think I'll leave it to the viewers to say it in their own words. From Ken Joyce and everyone at alienated.ie. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. That was super fantastic. Well done. Great. Thank you very much.